Hey all, Michael here just with a quick disclaimer that at about the five minute mark and lasting for about three minutes is a brief discussion about Star Wars The Last Jedi. If you haven't seen the film, we are talking some spoilers. So if you want to avoid that, as soon as Star Wars is brought up, skip three minutes ahead and you should be safe and we'll just carry on with Stephen King. Okay, enjoy. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Sorting Hat Podcast, a show where everything and anything can and will be sorted. I, as always, am your host, Michael Barrity, joined by my co-host, Reed Bryce. I'm your biggest fan, Michael. Oh, good. (laughs) You're going to hobble me, aren't you? I don't know. Reed is dead staring me, and it is a rough go. I'm going to just put this hatchet down. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Basic conceit of the show. For those unfamiliar is uh, we have an expert or fan of a topic and then we sort things into the various houses. You all know this. It's part two of Stephen (laughs) King. Abby Wilde's back. Hey, what's up? All the basic (laughs) credits that come with her are also here. Yeah, pretty important. If if you skip part one, fuck you. (laughs) That's what Michael said. (laughs) More or less. Like, why would you come into a part two? You don't know what we're talking about. You don't know our life. You don't know our choices. No, our rapport is already established. You need to catch up. Get with the times. Yeah, seriously, guys. Get with the time. Let's dive straight into it. We're starting with Misery, right? Misery. Misery was written in 1987. It's notable because it was written right after Stephen King got clean from uh, drug and alcohol addiction. He had been addicted. Uh, I I read earlier today in his Rolling Stone interview he did a couple of years ago that he dates it from about 1978 to 1986. Um, And so he later said that this was the novel that he wrote uh, about his addiction, which you wouldn't know unless you knew. Yeah. What happens in this book, which is all, it's really hard to pick favorites. It's like picking, I think, Neil Gaiman. Nope, you've, you've already picked your favorite. You <laughs> said it. that it, it was, was your it. favorite. But like Neil Gaiman says that picking your favorite book is like picking which of your limbs you would least like to lose. Mm. And that's how it feels with this. Misery is fantastic. Left foot. Yeah, probably. I mean, <laughs> like think like I've thought about this. It's your left foot. What? We're going to we're going to have a talk about that. We're doing it right now. All right. All right look, here's here's, oh, here's the reason. Here is the reasoning on this. Okay. Of the of the appendages that you use, you use your hands most frequently unless you're like a runner. Yeah, sure. Not losing but my hands. You're not going to lose your hands. Nope. Now, when you come down to your right and left foot, mm mm-hmm. Mhm. The reason that you want to lose the left foot, unless you're driving automatic, you don't use it when you drive. Hmm. Dude, that is some solid limb logic. I would also choose my left foot. Right? Okay. All right. Well, so misery. Uh, I'd lose my butt. Is a book about cocaine <laughs> addiction for Stephen King. <laughs> It, it could be. It depends on the size of your butt. My butt's hey. huge. I can, I, mean, I can stand to lose. I didn't want to say anything, but we're going to need to talk about your butt at I, some uh, point. If you haven't seen me, I, I, I have a butt that evokes uh, uh, Jennifer Lopez in the, in the biopic Selena. <laughs> I, have, I have a Selena-ass butt. <laughs> a Selena-ass butt. Continue with Misery. <laughs> so Misery is a book that's about drug addiction if you're Stephen King or about... Uh, and also about uh, the relationship between the relationship an artist has towards themselves and what they want their art to do and the relationship they have to their audience and what the audience wants mm-hmm. their art to do. It's Which about becomes it- more and more, uh, what is the word, prescient? Oh, gosh, yeah. Uh, it like this book, this book w- works forever. It's, I just, <laughs> uh But I feel like up until this point, because basically it's about a demanding fan. Yes. Uh, like trying to control how the author like drives a story. And I feel like before the internet, there was like a kind of disconnect and there was, I feel like artists have less control over their own work now. So much less. I mean, and, and not even less control, but certainly it depends on how strong they are personality wise. Uh, Certainly there was like a huge boycott of Outlander because um, a bunch of Outlander fans, when casting was announced for the stars show, uh, a bunch of fans were like, that's not my Jamie. He doesn't look at all like the way. And Diana Gabaldon, the author, came out and was like, look, I approved these casting choices. And if I say this is what Jamie looks like, then this is what Jamie looks like. 
And people did not like her attitude when she said this. So there was, I, if, I, if I remember correctly, there was like a movement to boycott the show. Sure. I mean, we saw this past December with The Last Jedi. So many oh people my were God. bitching and moaning about Star Wars and how The Last Jedi isn't their Star Wars. And guys, it's a fine movie. It's got flaws, but it's a fine movie and it's got a lot on its mind. It's so just enjoy powerful, it. It's about powerful older women and people of color. Just shut up and enjoy the awesome movie. It's <laughs> that's really exactly good. why they don't like it, though. I know. <laughs> no, no, no. That's not actually where most people draw issue. Where? The, their issue is the way that Luke is presented. They don't like I the fact. I love it. It was Mark yeah. Campbell's best performance right, but, ever. But they many felt that, well, it's multiple things. It's yeah. the fact that Luke was presented as like weak and broken, and which I think is cool. Yes. Uh, but also the fact that Ray's uh, parentage was undercut and the fact that Snoke was completely undercut of having like any mythos or background to him. Yeah, that's yeah. kind of a bummer. But, but here's like- the thing. If you looked, if you were growing up in the 70s and early 80s, when Empire Strikes Back comes out or the uh, or um or Return of the Jedi. You don't know jack shit about the emperor. Yeah. But in st- but for some reason now and it I partially blame uh JJ Abrams and his like mystery box construct that he applies to every single movie is doing so and also having such a long gap in between story elements allows for fan theories to run wild and everybody then takes ownership of these fan theories yeah so when you suddenly throw all those theories down a well if you go why did you kill this you this thing that i created is yeah. gone now but here's the thing everybody it's not you can still own that snoke is actually plagueis or whatever weird theory you have or that re- mm-hmm. i mean you can't really own the ray doesn't come from like you can't make Obi-Wan unless that suddenly changes in nine because like that is arguably It depends important. on whether or not we trust Kylo Ren. And honestly, we don't. Here's the thing, though, from a thematic standpoint and a like narrative argument, it's far more interesting if she comes from nothing. I do like it a lot mm-hmm. because it's a prescient. It's a prescient uh, message about where we all are right it, now. It doesn't matter where you come destiny from. Destiny doesn't matter. The, yes. Just choose to be here and fight with the rebellion. You Ooh. can you can come up from nothing and be a hero. And that's what all of our characters in the new trilogy is like. And, you and know then who in else came of, up from nothing? Oh, Annie Wilkes in Misery. So <laughs> I do want to say, though, I'm just going to like stick it to these nerds. <laughs> I choked on my water because I was so appreciative <laughs> of that transition. <laughs> Sorry. I, wa- I want to say while Michael dies, if you're mad that Luke Skywalker uh, became disheartened and ran away to a des- d- deserted planet, and why would he ever do that? No Jedi's ever done that. You mean literally the fact the thing that Yoda and Obi-Wan both did? They both fucking it's did what it. Oh! Jedi do it's the final life stage of Jedi is go hide out on a desert planet Luke and just reject happened to have some know. badass fish nuns who were gonna help him oh the fish nuns were badass so, <laughs> all right misery of fish yeah? nuns and <laughs> that was better that was so much better speaking of fish nuns Annie Wilkes yeah so the 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 book is nominally about uh, Paul Sheldon, who is an author who has always wanted to write his own books, but he is, to his great chagrin, best known for writing a series of Victorian romances about a character named Misery Chastain. And he is his last misery book is just about to come out. So while that book is like flying off the presses, he's gone to the Hotel Bull Dorado, which is where he writes the final drafts of all of his books, and he has written his first non-misery Paul Sheldon book in years. It's called Fast Cars. He loves it. It's brilliant. It's wonderful. He only ever writes one copy because he's superstitious. So he puts it in his suitcase. He gets in his car. He decides to drive to LA. There's a snowstorm. He drives off the road and uh, has a terrible accident. Luckily, he's rescued by Annie Wilkes. Annie Wilkes is a trained nurse, uh, is a bit of a hermit and a recluse, and is self-proclaimed his number one fan. She nurses him back to health and tells him that she can't take him to a hospital because the roads are still closed from the snow and they can't call for help because the phone lines are down. But don't worry, she'll take care of him. And while she's taking care of him, she manages to go into town, but not to get a hospital, and uh, get the latest misery book, which she's so excited about because she's read all of them and she can't wait. And she reads it and it, it turns out that 
Misery dies in this book. Paul Sheldon killed Misery. She flies off the handle. Um, she It's the whole new definition of flying off the handle. She goes nuts. She leaves him alone and bedridden for like four days so she can go calm down. And when she comes back, she brings him a uh, typewriter and some paper. And she says, you're going to write another Misery book and you're going to rescue her and you're going to fix it. And in the meantime, she also burns the manuscript of his new book. So he's got nothing. And he's, he's, he's like, his legs are, is, are shattered. Uh, she starts feeding him opiate, uh, opiate pain pills. So he becomes dependent on the pain medication. Holy shit. Um, yeah, there's, there's a point at which they're having an argument while she's mopping his floor and she feeds him dirty mop water. Like, she'll withhold food Damn. from him. She'll disappear. She'll show up sometimes and she'll, like, start telling him a story and she'll start getting really, really uh, uh, emotional about what she's saying. She'll start screaming at the top of her lungs and then her face will go blank and she'll, like, leave and not come back for days and days and days. Um, she's unhinged. She's kind of your nightmare fan. Yeah. Um, this is one that I don't want to go into further detail about because I feel like this is one, Michael Barrity, you should read because it's not immense. I've seen it. Oh, you've seen it. So you're good. Okay. All right. Never mind. Uh, spoiler alert, everyone. We're going to keep talking. There is a point at which uh, Paul Sheldon escapes from his bed uh, while she's while she's out, while she's out in the town. And he goes looking around for a telephone and finds that her telephone is disconnected. It's fake. Like there's in, in the book, the way they do it is there's actually glue in the phone jacks that it looks like a working telephone, but it isn't one. It's a prop. Whoa. And he finds she has a scrapbook of her entire life as a nurse, which he quickly realizes isn't her life as a nurse, but is actually the history of her life as the angel of death who had a track record of murdering infants and elderly people in all of the hospitals she worked oh, so in. He, she's a serial killer. Yes. Yes, she was never prosecuted for it. They couldn't pin it on her. Uh, there are pictures of her reading misery books in jail. Man. The irony is that through this entire experience, she's actually a fantastic critic because he starts to write her a book where everything's fine and misery is fine. And she goes, nope, that's not good enough. You can't just decide that misery is okay. She was dead at the end of the last book, so you have to get her out of the ground. Start there. So he writes a brilliant freaking misery book. And then he beats her over the head with a typewriter and escapes. <laughs> I love this book. <laughs> I, I love this book, but I also love the life of this book after the book was published because I love there was a, a movie in 1990 starring uh, a then virtually unknown Kathy Bates. It was her breakout film. And role. she is so phenomenal. Good. Mm -hmm. So good. Uh, this movie was adapted and directed by Rob Reiner, who mm. was Stephen King's only choice for the book because of the way he directed Stand By Me previously oh, I see. in the 80s. I see, I see. Yeah. Stephen King loved Stand By Me so much that after the first screening, he literally burst into tears and hugged Rob Reiner because it felt so autobiographical. Yeah, if you don't know, Stephen King has not always been the most enchanted with uh, his film, with the adaptations of his film. He famously <laughs> hates The Shining. Oh, um, maybe not even as much because he did later concede that some parts of it, and we'll start The Shining next, maybe. Uh, he did concede that there were that there were parts of it that were good, but mostly he just hated the he just hated the way Kubrick felt. I mean, Kubrick isn't Kubrick, everyone's cup of tea. Kubrick <laughs> plays by Kubrick's rules, oh and so God. if you are ascribing to what Kubrick has decided his world is going to look like, you're just not going to have a good time, right? Well, uh, but speaking of like people uh, demanding to have things their own way, Annie Wilkes, yeah, and. Uh, did you know that uh, this, besides his uh, his his substance abuse problems, this is also based on the fact that uh, er, as early as like the '80s, he wanted to get away from the horror genre. Yes. He wrote a fantasy novel, and it was so roundly rejected, very much just on the basis that there were no horror elements to it. And so this was kind of like a response to the rest of the community saying that you are literally holding me hostage in this mm -hmm. genre. And I don't necessarily know if this is what I want. After Eyes of the Dragon, he actually established a pseudonym, Richard Bachman, and wrote, I think, five Bachman books before uh, he was outed, much in the manner of J.K. Rowling and Robert Galbraith. Um, and in fact, Misery was intended to be a Bachman book, but he was outed before it was finished. Oh, interesting. Um, the Bachman books, I haven't read all of them, but one of them, 
which uh, we're not going to sort because it's a Bachman book and not a King book, is uh, <laughs> The Long Walk, which I love on its own merits, but I especially love because it was The Hunger Games before The Hunger Games was The Hunger mm. Games. It's very similar in plot. Go check it out. I love The Hunger Games, but read The Long Walk. I'm going to say something super inflammatory. Get the whole internet mad at me. Oh, my oh, gosh. Oh, do it. Do it, This Reed. one's a Ravenclaw because it's so much of a, a very much. It's I'm such gonna a have Ravenclaw. My own, I'm going to have my own way. There is a right and wrong answer sort of shit that why sometimes. Why did you they think can... this was going to inflame the internet? No. I'm, I, we're all, I think. <laughs> I will say that that's not why I would call it a Ravenclaw. Oh, why? Oh, why would you call it a Ravenclaw? I'll tell you why I would call it a Ravenclaw, <laughs> Michael Barrity. It is a Ravenclaw because it's about books. Uh, it's about uh, cunning it's about it's it's this entire book is a claustrophobic with 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 a brief sojourns outside of this little world to see what the local small town police sheriff another fixture on your Stephen King bingo card oh for sure uh, to see what to see what he's doing to figure this out and uh, occasional jaunts to Paul Sheldon's agent who's trying to figure out where Paul Sheldon went to other than that it's just these two characters alone in this house outwitting each other at every turn Annie is uh is is crazy but she is brilliant right paul is uh has god knows he has his flaws but he is brilliant and he has to be and he gets out of this using his using his cunning using his cunning for that argument you could lean towards slytherin for that very reason because the slytherins are known for their cunning but i agree i agree when it's a ravenclaw i I would also say like this could also be uh, it's it's like cerebral because uh, in Ke- in King getting sober and writing through this process, mm-hmm. it's, it's him at his most self aware probably. Mm-hmm. So I, I I would definitely and safely put it at Ravenclaw. Is there anything else on Misery we need to cover before we move on? If you haven't seen it, you should definitely see it. It's such a brilliant performance from both James Caan and Annie Wilkes. It's also notable uh, Annie Wilkes, Kathy Bates. Wow. It's also <laughs> notable that uh, a couple of years ago there was a Broadway run. Uh, William Goldman adapted his screenplay from the movie um, and it starred uh, Bruce Willis and Laurie Metcalf. And I didn't see it because apparently I like to deny myself pure joy. I regret this forever. Bruce and Laurie, if you're listening, please do a revival for me in my apartment. I am trying to even wrap my head around how fun that would be. It had to have been I mean, spectacular. For those of you unfamiliar with uh, Laurie Metcalf. Why? It, like, why is the first question. But like, uh, right now she's in this like little uh, movie that's doing really well called Lady Bird, which you guys should definitely check she out. definitely go see She that. is... Like everyone else is now saying what I've been knowing since like 1989 with Roseanne. She is one of the greatest living actors that we have. She's Ugh. so good in that film. And I like I know you loved I, Tanya Reed. Yeah. Uh, and Allison Jenny's great. But I would give Laurie Metcalf the like Oscar. Honestly, over. Allison I don't know. Jenny. I don't know. I feel like I want Laurie Metcalf and Allison Janney to adopt me. Yeah. Well, I mean, I like I, I don't want to live in a world where I choose only one. You'd be in a great spot if that ad, if those adoption papers were signed. Like, I don't yeah. think anybody would be like, yeah. oh, your moms are who now? You'd be like, uh, uh too fantastic. Anyway, I'm a Jenny hyphen Metcalf. I will say I love Laurie Metcalf in, in Lady Bird so much. That I wish that the film had actually been uh, about her instead of <laughs> Greta Gerwig. Because like. I think I, I think I think I'm the only white millennial who didn't cry watching that movie. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet, explicitly because everyone tells me that I should, and that's the number one way to keep me I from watching something. I I'll didn't. Say, I'll say cry. go see it, but I I'll go see it, but like it's it's no, taking it's, me a bit. I, and I don't know if maybe just like particularly like just the people that I hang out with. This like people are saying that this like, and I think it also might be this is one of the first period films from our from our generation right. that this is specifically taking place at a time where they're just throwing out all of these like the these sort of like uh hallmarks that we can grab onto go that that's from my time right uh but most of my friends say they walked out and they immediately called their mom and like said i love you and like and like cried and i just like walked out of it going like wanted more Lori metcalf (laughs) (laughs) Metcalf. Uh, i would also say go watch early Roseanne and tell me that she's not give she and uh and uh John Goodman John Goodman are giving you 
some of the best television acting performances oh, you'll ever see. There was an episode of Roseanne where uh, uh, Roseanne Barr was in contract disputes with the producers, and so she refused to film an episode. So they wrote an episode where the premise was that Ro- Roseanne was like going out of town for some reason. I don't, I don't remember. And the episode was all Laurie Metcalf and John Goodman. And they were so good that the producers were like, what if we just rebranded the show and made it just Laurie Metcalf and John Goodman? And unfortunately, Laurie Metcalf and John Goodman weren't terrible people. And they were like, no, we're not going to do that yeah, to well, Roseanne. Yeah, fucking bonkers. But, but I would have watched the hell out of that. While that in the first, I would say the first couple of seasons, you should definitely revisit if you are just really like, I, I am a historian of television because they took Roseanne, who was still very like such a greenhorn to acting. Mm-hmm. And they because on the first season is very much like Seinfeld, where it was very much in the first season framed around the stand up bits. Sure. Yeah. But that is not enough. And so John Goodman and Lori Metcalf took her her very like at times she's just straight up doing stand up while she's in character. Yeah. Right. And they brought they brought the nuance and the humanity that is remembered Ugh. for that show. I'm not saying that Roseanne didn't give it the working class sensibility that it needed, but they brought the performance that we all remember to they're, make this they're an, the heart of the an show. actual family. Yeah. Dude, first couple seasons of Roseanne Ugh. are probably prime television. They're probably the most influential things on me as an artist. Uh, and I don't want to think about anything that Roseanne has said in the last decade. No. Nope. <laughs> and I don't, I'm, I don't know if I'm going to watch the new series. Oh, yeah. How can they do that? Because Dan is supposed to be dead. That's just going to be undone. <laughs> okay, good. I think because that entire be... last season should be undone. But yeah, no, uh, that last season was bonkers. It was uh, nonsense. They're, I think they're probably going to rewind to right before he died and just make it so that, that none of that none of that last season ever happened. Cool. I'll take it. Um, but man, Roseanne is transphobic and racist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <my>. Damn. <laughs> but, she got real bad. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> let's talk about The Shining, because we Shining. said that we were going to talk about The Shining right after we talked about Misery, and then we talked for like 10 minutes about not anything. Dude, and we sorting. talked about Laurie Metcalf and John Goodman, and none of those minutes were wasted. No, it's true. <laughs> it's true. What's The Shining about? Oh, so The Shining, in case you don't know, and I've got I'm going to admit The Shining is not my strongest uh, Stephen King novel. I, One of my dear friends, Nate Betancourt, is The Shining master. He's going to listen to this and he's going to have notes for me. Uh, the Shining mainly takes place uh, at the Overlook well, Hotel. He more than, is more than welcome. He has an open invitation to come on the pod. <laughs> you hear that, Nate? Get it together. Um, the Shining takes place in Colorado at another Colorado hotel, not the same one that Paul Sheldon was at, although the events of Misery do refer to the events of The Shining because all Stephen King books kind of take place in the same universe as uh, idealized in his Dark Tower series, which we oh, won't yeah. sort because we would never be done. Uh, the is Shining, that series completed? Yes, or it is. It is, but he's come out and said he's never going to like put it's 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 finished but he could always write more stuff for mm-hmm. it he could just be like and this story was happening off in the background oh yeah he could he could jk rolling that like forever mm-hmm. um the shining uh it takes place at the overlook hotel which is a uh a, a, a gigantic uh isolated um morass of a mansion up in the rockies and jack torrance who's an aspiring and failing writer gets a job to be the caretaker uh, in the off season. So he and his wife and his young boy, Danny, go and uh, go and go and live alone in this gigantic hotel. And honestly, that really exhausts my plot synopsizing abilities about this book. I mean, at that point, everything uh sort of goes off the rails as far as it's a haunted house it's stephen king's haunted house book it's a haunted house book but it's it's both a combination because i mean i've watched the film sure and and uh reed you can certainly correct me if i'm Mm -hmm. wrong there are two things sort of operating concurrent Mm -hmm. to one another Mm -hmm. but not directly running like one is not affecting the other there's Danny, who has Shining. Or- yes, which is a which is a trope of uh, it's other Stephen King bingo item is uh, innocent child, innocent child with some sort of paranormal ability. Yeah. And so he has some degree of possession of 
Tony, I believe, is the. I think Tony is the the, the, the little friend, the, the voice. voice in his finger. Mm-hmm. Um, which and, just makes me think of Mr. Bimble from Muppet Treasure Island. Right. Yeah. Which Muppet Treasure Island is the best Why Muppets film. Why didn't we film. sort Muppet movies? <laughs> like, it is the best. Blind Pierre is one of my favorite goddamn bits of ever any Muppet film. His name is Blind Pew, Michael Barrett. Is it Pew? It is. Are you yeah. sure? I'm, not, I'm gonna he look is, this up while you guys talk French. about The Shining. It's, I am so sure it's Blind Pierre. But maybe my whole childhood was, you know, Mandela affected. You know, doesn't that movie have uh, what I consider to be the new song of 2018, Kokomo, by the Beach Boys in it? I don't, I or don't do know they, Or did the Muppets just record a cover of Kokomo? Blind. I don't, I don't Blind Pew is a character in Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. But in the Muppet Treasure Blind Island. Blind Pew Muppet. Blind Pew Muppet Wiki. Blind Pew is a threatening pirate who hunts for Billy Bones in Muppet Treasure Island. Well, you're two for two in correcting me on a character, <laughs> Look, Abby just, Wild. I'm just trying to usher you into this Berenstain Bears reality in which nothing that you know is the truth. <laughs> hey, look, if I'm wrong on characters or actor names, I'll learn to live. <laughs> How? Um, the other thing that's notable about The Shining. Of the many things that are notable about The Shining. Um, one, Stephen King bingo items. You have uh, innocent child, in, in, innocent child with a supernatural ability, but you also have working class writer. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, one of the plot elements is that Jack Torrance is, I, I think you were hinting at this. You have, so you have uh, Danny with his supernatural ability. You have the haunted house element, but you also have the slowly crumbling sanity of Jack Torrance under right. the weight of both his failure as a writer uh, the malevolent influence of the house, and thirdly, uh, his alcoholism, which is notable because this book was written in 1977, and uh, that was right before King started hitting hitting drugs, but mm-hmm. while he was still drinking pretty heavily. Uh, I also want to name check um, that that this book expands on something that I think was really done first and done very well by Shirley Jackson in The Haunting, where it's a haunted house where the house isn't just a backdrop for the ghosts, the house itself is a malevolent creature. Like the, the, uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the same as, uh, um, um, Amityville horror also. Plays Amityville that. horror does that as well. So Hill house, Amityville horror. Um, uh, and, and when uh, I overlook- say Amityville horror, I'm definitely talking the like original, which is like so good. <laughs> I didn't see it, but I definitely read that book at one point. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. That sounds par for the course. We're estab- we're, we've established this. You've read the book. I've seen the movie. Wow. Well. Uh, this this also was, I think, like the second or third book by King. And this is the one that, like, if Carrie and 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 whatever uh, might have come after it, Christine like, we're, or we're Cujo, doing well. maybe. I feel no, because this was one of his earlier books. It's like second or third. Cause it, so was it was Christine third after Salem's Lot. OK, oh, thank you. All right. This was the one that fucking blew up, if I'm remembering mm-hmm. correctly. And this is the one that made everyone go like, oh, Stephen King, you're the horror guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that uh, earmarked him pretty bad, which is pretty funny because this also seems like all of King's work seems pretty like autobiographical and like some of its thematics. But this one especially seems like it was probably painful for his family to to read if they read it. Like, yeah, because it straight up is like dealing with like a, the abuse uh, that comes from somebody's uh, succumbing to alcoholism. And question, yeah, sorry to cut you off. No, go for it. Um, how was his relationship with his wife? I can't speak to how his relationship with his wife was at this time. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was, you know, this was. Three years after Carrie, I can't imagine that things had gotten as bad as they were going to get before they got better. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I can't in good conscious comment on that. What I okay. can say is that the book itself uh, it, it speaks a lot to um, Jack Torrance's, I, I guess, the the in, increasing division between himself as a family man and himself as an artist. And, and he right. starts to take that out very badly on his wife and his child and Mm -hmm. they are kind of alone in this gigantic house watching him crumble into madness and they're trapped there by the elements and i would say there was probably a lot of like isolating feelings of suddenly having 
your husband or father become a celebrity overnight. Mm -hmm. There has to be something incredibly alienating about that. Sure. And yeah, I I was just thinking on, I mean, especially if he grew up around in Maine, thereabouts. He did. He grew up in Bangor. So you've got isolation. Mm -hmm. You've got snow. You've got a a recent uh, or like a fairly new father as far as fatherhood was relative, like, so kids probably about Danny's age. And then you've got this weird uh, house that seems to be really making some nasty, nasty thoughts take place. And he apparently, um, if I'm incorrect, you can certainly correct me, as I know you have so far. Uh, Stephen King went on record saying that, like, all of these things were just like nightmares that he had and sort of manifested into then writing or. I'm looking at uh, I'm looking at what he said right now. Should I read it? Yes, please do. All right. So this is from the Wikipedia page in case anyone wants to check my sources. Uh, on October 30th, 1974, King and his wife, Tabitha, checked into the Stanley Hotel uh, in Estes Park, uh, Colorado. They checked into room 217, which was said to be haunted. Um, King and his wife had dinner that evening in the grand dining room, totally alone. They were offered one choice for dinner, the only meal still available. After dinner, his wife decided to turn in, but King took a walk around the empty hotel. He ended up in the bar and was served drinks by a bartender named Grady. That night, quote, I dreamed of my three-year-old son running through the corridors, looking back over his shoulder, eyes wide, screaming. He was being chased by a fire hose. I woke up with a tremendous jerk sweating all over within an inch of falling out of bed. I got up, I got up, lit a cigarette, sat in a rocking chair, looking out the window at the Rockies, and by the time the cigarette was done, I had the bones of the book firmly set in my mind. Sometimes you confess. You always hide what you're confessing to. That's one of the reasons why you make up the story. When I wrote The Shining, for instance, the protagonist of The Shining is a man who has broken his son's arm, who has a history of child beating, who has beaten himself. And as a young father with two children, I was horrified by my occasional feelings of real antagonism towards my children. Won't you ever stop? Won't you ever go to bed? And time has given me the idea that probably there are a lot of young fathers and young mothers, both who feel very angry, who have angry feelings toward their children. But as somebody who has been raised with the idea that father knows best and Ward Cleaver on Leave it to Beaver and all this stuff, I would think to myself, oh, if he doesn't shut up, if he doesn't shut up. So when I wrote this book, I wrote a lot of that down and tried to get it out of my system. But it was also a confession. Yes, there are times when I felt very angry toward my children and have even felt as though I could hurt them. My kids are older now. Naomi is 15 and Joey is 13 and Owen is eight. And they're all super kids. And I don't think I've laid a hand on one of my kids in probably seven years. But there was a time dot dot dot. I mean, and that's, I think that's incredible. I mean, it's fucked up, but it's incredibly honest in a way that a lot of people don't mm-hmm. want to be about uh, parenthood, especially. Yeah. Like the idea that like, you not only don't have to like your kids all the time, but there's going to be feelings. I'm sure at times where you're like, I just straight up I fucking extreme hate you. animosity. Oh Look, my God. What have I done? <laughs> two to four year olds are the least reasonable, most needy beings you will ever meet. And they, as, 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 uh, People who have just learned that they can walk and run and climb and speak in complete sentences. They feel like they have all of the powers of the universe and in their make grasp. demands and make demands. Well, and they hate it, to be thwarted. It's, it's around exhausting. the time that they realize that they're not part of a hive mind, because up mm-hmm. until a certain point uh, from a developmental uh, point of view, you don't know that not everything around you knows everything that you know. And mm-hmm. conversely, you don't know that you don't know everything. Mm-hmm. So the moment you find out, that's when the experimentation can begin. But you haven't yet figured out that uh, the grownups around you have their own interior lives that are not entirely all about you. Right. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you still you exist. Need, you need to suddenly come to the realization that the sun is the, not the center. You know, like, yeah, the earth isn't the center of the universe. I'm, I'm I know what you're saying. You have to realize that you are that the world does not revolve around you. Yes. Right. Yes. That's what I was trying to say. I got you. But it's a little bit later than my mind is able to keep <laughs> up with. We've talked apparently. about a lot of things. Yeah. tonight. Mm-hmm. So I think it's I think it's really interesting that he would frame it this way uh, and just be so candid of like, yeah, we're opening up this book with you knowing that this person like beat his son so badly that his arms broken. And now they're all about to be cloistered together. So by themselves what's also interesting about this piece is this is a horror film or a horror book sure that kind of goes against a lot of what would be usual tropes that would lead to like a large body count Mm -hmm. as far as horror goes like Mm -hmm. if you look to it or if you look to carrie Mm -hmm. at the end of those books lots of people are dead there are lots of dead bodies sure 
in the case of The Shining, it's the isolation that really is the scariest thing. And what is it like two people are dead by the end of The Shining? Something like, yeah, it's uh, it's spoiler alert, Jack Torrance and um, the, the caretaker who tells the caret- uh, Danny about I don't remember his name. Well, it's Scatman Crothers. Scatman Crothers in the movie who tells Danny about the shine. Yeah. Yeah. But like, those are the only two, at least as far as I can recall, Mm -hmm. that are dead. And Mm -hmm. then we've got some other characters who may or may not be real. Um, Sure. But then you've also, I mean, those are the only ones that are dead. But Danny and his mom are going to need some serious therapy after that. Oh, for sure. Yes. (laughs) But like, that's a cast of four people. Mm -hmm. And so you half it by the end. But. It's only it's only two deaths. That's yeah. pretty miraculous. It's also pretty more, good uh, thematically for us to to talk about the maze aspect. Not only for like there there's a maze in the in the yard uh, that is uh, the hedge maze. Law, the hedge maze that ends up being very important to the plot, but also uh, and especially in the film. I don't know if this was a creation of Stanley Kubrick. He also makes the actual hotel into a maze uh, by at certain points making it. Uh, physically and geographically impossible for characters to be moving throughout the space the way that they do. I too have seen Room 237. I used to watch before Room 237, which is a great documentary about uh, fan theories. There are actually uh, there was actually quite a body of work of documentary uh, conspiracy work on the internet that predates it. Really? Yeah, I watched like a two, like because like, I'm this fucking kind of nerd. Uh, like You're my favorite kind of like nerd. five years before that doc came out, I watched like two hours. It took a long time to download because I had bad internet. Of like a single person laying out their conspiracy theory about The Shining. That was mostly about uh, the like the uh, imperialistic Manifest Destiny stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've not heard this. What? Go on. Well, one of the theories is that Kubrick was trying to tell the story about white imperialism and violence against Native Americans and also women and, you know, just every like everything uh, that we're talking about right now <laughs> in the news. Sure. <laughs> uh, and like that he put he put like symbology in there so you would just know gotcha. over and over again that that's what this is about but there are a lot of different ways that you can interpret the film because Kubrick is so exacting mm-hmm. in, in what in his vision uh, that you go all the way back around a full circle and and, and, and they're like I have there are so many ways I can read into this mm-hmm. and Kubrick also was not somebody so to Kubrick, just Kubrick talk at length about what his films were about effectively created his own uh, Winchester house yeah in not just architecturally but also thematically and yeah. metaphorically so there's a lot there's a lot about like going through which have you ever been to the, the winchester maze. mystery house no it is a <laughs> delight that's I the one that the, the, the lady was like oh my family made all these guns that killed all these people yes. and now all of them are a ghost fortune teller me? a fortune teller told her something like something like she would die after the house was complete so the house well, had to always be yeah in so she was construction she was under the assumption that one what this fortune tell her told her was true Mm -hmm. and all the dead spirits who had been murdered by her husband's winchester rifles would be coming to haunt her so they continued construction in such a fashion that stairs lead into the ceiling and doors lead into rooms that just close like you can't get out once you get into certain rooms it is it's a not freaky at all. It is a wild time. If you get to go on a tour, I would highly encourage if you're if you're basically if you're around San Jose in California, you just take the two hours that you need to go to the Winchester Mystery House. Also, there's like uh, some interesting stuff with the garden, I believe the way that like the hedges are constructed there there's some astrology stuff also in there Cause it's- like uh because because like this all happened around the time of the rise of spiritualism right where it was like i kind, believe so it was yes. like it was the way that like puritanical sort of like uh white folks could also get into ghosts and the occult without getting in trouble for it or maybe they did yeah. get in, in trouble for it i don't remember the church I, wasn't I was ever <laughs> wild about you starting to believe in that sort of stuff uh, but, but you it know it was constructed in 1884 which was shortly before which was around the rise of spiritual spiritualism oh, okay, cool, cool. so uh you know that 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 fortune teller was like what how rich I'm a fuck with this lady. <laughs> <laughs> like that's the story I want to follow is just you being know like that was like you. I'm not going to say that I would do it, but it would be very <laughs> tempting to ri- to like make a rich person think that their wealth and the source of their income that has caught co- objectively caused a lot of misery. 
to make them. It would be, but at the same so time, crazy. I find it so charming what rich people will find to worry about. <laughs> you know, like, oh, you don't have to worry about paying rent. So you're going to decide that you're haunted by the ghosts of everyone who's been killed at the Winchester it's, rival. It's and a logical step. It is. It's the next most logical so, step. I mean, How do we feel about sorting the shining? Yes. I, this one, this one rather. You know, like my gut reaction is Slytherin, but I can't really, I'm not sure I can justify that. Because mm-hmm. uh, again, this is a book that I don't have a strong relationship to as maybe I do to the others. I would say maybe you're on the right track in terms of like this, this one deals with. I how, think it's not a Hufflepuff. How the family not can, a Hufflepuff. How the family can break down, but uh, specifically how it can break down through, uh, and I don't turn, I don't throw this term out lightly, toxic masculinity. No, definitely. And this idea both of, uh like artistic ego but also like uh not feeling like you can uh have like an intimate relationship with your with your family and that it has to, it has this like separation also if we do buy into the whole like uh you know imperialism uh uh manifest destiny uh theories which i think are the closest to what kubrick was probably trying to allude to right, if, but if we're, we're taking talking, but we're speaking on the novel we're only speaking of the novel i would say so. i would say it would be most respectful to stephen king to sort only on the novel well he's the one who's alive so i'm not <laughs> so who's <laughs> and i'm sure he listens to the pod so. but it is a book that's a, like it has a lot to do with um i i feel like jack torrance's whole like conflict is the choice of self versus the choice of family mm-hmm. right you know he does he want to be a good guy who puts aside his vices mm-hmm. and one could argue that writing is for him as much of a vice as drinking is as mm-hmm. is his temper yeah uh, as is alienating himself from his wife and child does he want to be a good guy who puts those aside to take care of his family or does he want to choose himself at the expense of them and he ultimately in the climax of the novel he like the the house has kind of seized control of him right, right? and he's chasing uh danny through the hedge maze tries to kill him he uh, 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 Halloran, who is who Scatman Crothers plays. Ah, oh, there God. we are. Halloran shows up and kind of like what distracts name. him, right? Great name. Uh, and 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 uh, Jack comes back to himself enough that he's able to like let Danny go and let Danny be free. Yeah. And he goes and he blows up the house with himself <laughs> inside of it by like overloading the boiler or something. So yeah, you can see that there is like a great departure and even just the basic storytelling from the film. Would if you've seen it the film. be prudent to direct ourselves and this casts uh, you in the dark a little bit read, uh-huh. uh, but to look to the Malfoys as a reference piece. I as, was literally about to say the same thing. Like, because is, is Jack Torrance a Lucius Malfoy? That's exactly what I was thinking. Uh, I don't think, that, I mean, expand on that, please. Tell me, tell me more about where you're going down that road. I was simply viewing it as the Malfoys. The redemption ha- story, the last yeah, minute they Hail ha- Grace. They have a redemption tale Hail Mary, rather. of Draco. Um, <laughs> I could see where you're going there because I don't know a lot about it. I do know that the little wiener kid's constantly trying to figure out if he wants to. Like, you can tell he wants to go and be cool and good like the other guys. Draco does. But yeah, but he just keeps getting yeah. pulled back by well, his fucking like, uh, well, evil family. And the Malfoys in general put a big strain on family name. So there's a, there's a conflict that comes, I suppose, in I mean, they're they're not the embodiment of Slytherin by any means, but they are the, the mo- foremost Slytherins in the exactly. Book. Yeah. yeah. O- outside of like Voldemort. Voldemort, Sure. Mm-hmm. So there's the part of me that feels like that is the Slytherin struggle. That we see throughout the course of the book being like, do I go for because it's ambition versus it's, it's ambition of just like this has to be just me. It can't be the rest of them creating this. It is definitely self versus community. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. I yes, I like that. I think that that justifies my my otherwise unjustified gut reaction to call this book a Slytherin just because and I want also to the sli- like in the Slytherin angle, like people report that like uh, the book and but also especially the movie uh, is the one that like out of all of his films seems to like really get under the skin of the viewer. 
Hmm. Uh, I've like I like I have a lot of friends who are like I couldn't finish it. It was too scary. I wasn't scared like, by the sh- by the Shining, and I felt totally cheated by that. Mm-hmm. Like I, I, I maybe it was because I'm one of those behind the scenes people who watches a whole lot of how a movie was made, and I tend to spoil things for mm-hmm. myself that mm-hmm. way because that was my way of getting around the fact I wasn't allowed to watch horror films. Do you have an overly active imagination? No, I don't think. I mean, I. I do in the sense that I can go on a flight of fancy for mm-hmm. like hours and hours, but not in the sense that something would horrify me. Okay. Because like, well, did you see it? The most recent iteration? Yes. Were you scared during that? No. I would. Okay. So we're different in that regard. I had regard. a lot of fun. Like I the, had like, there were jump scares, the, but that's not the same as the being The first horrified. death of Georgie, which we talked about in the, in the previous episode, was probably the only scary part of the oh film. Oh my gosh. Oh. The, the rest en- of it was like to me it was like the a entire movie i was like clenched up in my chair because you just get like the slightest inclination that something bad is going to happen and especially maybe it's also the fact that i'd not seen the tv movie oh gotcha so i was going in completely sure, blind. blind outside of knowing like it lives in the sewers uh I would say and I and I would say like with with that in mind that I could have that bias. I think mostly like this one play the film. It played out more like a coming of age film, even more oh, than sure, the, sure, the, sure. the original miniseries. But thing. back to The Shining. Sorry to detract from. Yeah. So we, we, from, we'd agree. You oh, wait. So you were saying that uh, to get around not being able to watch like uh, scary movies or anything. It was like already would you watch like the making of? Yeah. Stuff? Or there was that, <laughs> that thing on Bravo for a few years, which was like a hundred greatest horror movies, horror movie. Oh, yeah, I was like four, I watched oh, it those are great. And over and over. Uh, so I knew yeah. everything about The Shining almost those, before Do those I shows watched still it. happen as often now that they, we have we all have like tiny computers that can pull up anything at any time? Probably not. And I say that that's a shame and a loss. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the fact that so many people are just going for streaming a movie as opposed to getting like the special features and yeah. all of that. Because like, I mean, if you, the special features on the Lord of the Rings trilogy oh, sets my God. are like hands down I, I think there was definitely a point at which i had the actor commentary memorized oh oh fantastic stuff <laughs> so good i For- mean now the closest thing would probably be on hbo shows mm-hmm. with like like game of thrones has pretty oh, the part at the end where the where the creators mansplain the episode to you as if you didn't <laughs> just sit through it oh i've not i'm not familiar with that part but <sighs> i would say for me um because i wasn't that kind of nerd i think uh the simpsons commentary on the box sets for the simpsons dvds like you're getting uh ivy league educated men to dissect their own work and that's both funny just on its own value to watch men like like smell their own farts but also (laughs) uh, but also they were giving you some like fantastic like i would consider that a master class on writing an american sitcom because the simpsons are like considered if you go to like season three or season four you're learning how some of the greatest television jokes and in the Simpsons, I think remain like giving you joke, like joke per minute. What some of the consistently best work. Yeah. And if and you want telling more, you how it works. And if you want more on the Simpsons, we sorted some episodes with Billy Domino. My ex-boyfriend. A ways back. Yes. Uh, also, <laughs> I'm delighted that steamed hams has become like a meme on the internet. It's there's one person who did like a, uh, playthrough on the piano where they noted all of the lines and it is hilarious to oh watch. My God. In any case, uh we only did two. Would you, we like to quickly, I say, close out with something? Sure, why not? We're going to do the Green Mile. All right, let's all do right. the Green Mile. The Green Mile is the other Stephen King prison story that was made into <laughs> a movie that was adapted and directed by Frank Darabont. Frank Darabont adapted and directed The Green Mile, The Shawshank Redemption, and then wrote one original film, to my knowledge, which was The Majestic, starring Jim Carrey. Mm. <laughs> we talked about the, him last episode. In part one. If you're one of the dozen people who saw that movie, uh, this will be true for you. Tweet us and tell us what it's about, because <laughs> I have not seen that movie. I just remember, like, he's in a movie theater, maybe? He he opens a theater. He builds a theater. I yeah, think he's got he, memory At one problems. point, he might be standing in the street with his arms outreach because that's also like a trope of Jim Carrey's. Like, it's like there's a, a he, trope of Darabont novels, though. Uh, Darabont movies, though, too, because John Coffey does it in The Green Mile and Andy Dufresne does it in The Shawshank Redemption. Interesting. Standing in the rain in the Christ position. It's just a thing Darabont <laughs> loves. Mm. So we're, we're doing The Green Mile. Lay that out for so us. So The Green Mile uh, was published in the late 90s, and it was done experimentally in a series of chapbooks, which are like 
about a hundred page. Uh, it was it was done as a serial novel, the way that Charles Dickens used to publish. So this his was novel. a dime store oh, novel. Weird. It was a dime store novel. He put in no the idea. present day. Yeah, and he published one one hundred page chat book uh, every month for six months. And then a few months later, there was a paperback collected edition. And then a few months after that, there was like a hardcover edition. I was looking this up beforehand and was very confused when I was like, he released six green miles in a year or whatever it was. I was yeah, like, no, the what? total of it was like 600 pages. It was it was, it was OK. That must have been like uh, like that must have been a marathon unless he had already written them out and then like like. Eked them out. I'm sure he had editor notes that he was just like, all right, I'll deal with these. The and great that. thing about Stephen King is that he is one of those writers who writes because he just has to and he loves to. And he writes oh, sure. pages and pages and pages and pages every day. I am never worried about like how Stephen King writes all of those pages. I am worried about how he chooses which pages not to publish because I think that sometimes he doesn't make that choice correctly. Mm. Um, but uh, uh, I, 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 I. I actually hope that he wrote the Green Mile concurrent to it being published because I want to live in that world where that happened. Where he's just like, it gets to like to be the day before he's like, oh, right? fuck, he's like, oh, fuck. Why did I do this to myself? I'm the worst. <laughs> Damn it, Stephen. I hope that Stephen King talks to himself in the third person when he's frustrated. Why, Stephen? Why? <laughs> All right. So we're assuming, <laughs> we're assuming that, he, that he was like sprinting through this process. Where did the story take us in the Green Mile? The Green Mile begins in an old folks home with paul edgecombe who is explaining to his uh his his elderly lady special lady friend because when you're an elderly person you don't have boyfriends and girlfriends you have special lady friends or gentlemen callers and they fuck a lot (laughs) they do not they play mahjong quietly in the rain (laughs) yes mahjong (laughs) quietly in the rain apparently just so you know mahjong was fuck quietly was loudly in the rain was wherever they damn well (laughs) grandparents if they're in a home they are polyamorous and they're loving it Uh, like as apparently uh you guys have plans well like um, because there's so much like uh, stigma against sex uh, in older generations, like you know, as you go older, uh, they don't have as much uh, information about like contraception and stuff. So your your grandparents are fucking and they're getting the clap. Just so you know, you know who didn't get the clap? <laughs> Paul Edgecombe and the Green Mile. It's actually a plot point <laughs> that they don't fuck. No, that he can't get the clap. What? It's his superpower. <laughs> I mean, sort of. So Paul is telling the story of when he <laughs> used to be um, the the head guard on death row in the early 30s. And uh, in the book, in the in in the book, it spans like, I think, about 10 to 20 years in the movie. They uh, they they um, condense it a bit more. But uh, they got a man on uh, death row named John Coffey, who was uh, this is, again, a Stephen King bingo item a uh, childlike simpleton with uh, supernatural powers. Um, he's a gigantic, a gigantic black man who has, uh, who when we meet him, all we know about him is that he's gigantic. He's not very bright. He doesn't seem to have much of a memory. He doesn't have much of a vocabulary. And he was found holding the blood-soaked bodies of two dead little white girls. Um, oh. Yeah. Which so, seems pretty... Pretty incriminating. Yeah, pretty damning. Uh, there are... Uh, there are other uh, other inmates on the mile of note are uh, Arlen Bitterbuck, who is the first one who we see uh, who we see executed because if you're on if if you're setting a book on death row, you're going to see some executions. Yeah, you guys set those stakes. Mm-hmm. Edward Delacroix. Um, and uh, he was that he was the guy equivalent of, you know, in speed when the bus they're like, the bus can't slow down. Mm-hmm. If anyone tries to get off this bus, you'll die. Remember that one lady who's like, I'm getting off the bus anyway. And then she immediately dies. Yeah. Because the guy sets off the yeah. explosion. She's the bitter buck. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the bitter. I'm going to not, I'm that, saying, I'm gonna say this now. Serious. This is a new term. If the bitter buck is if the, you're new the person, gun. you're the person who's setting up what the consequences will be in a, in a suspense or horror uh, or action thing. You're bitter bucking. Bitter bucking is great. I like that as a term. It's a good one, I, especially because it sounds like a euphemism for something. I just really, want, oh, sure. I really want to coin a term. I feel <laughs> you know like I, mean? I feel like by the end of this podcast, Urban Dictionary will have a completely different definition for bitter bucking. <laughs> Look, <laughs> gross. Reed, you've done it. You've done you've, it. <laughs> <laughs> It'll 
be the only intelligent thing I ever offered this podcast. Your peak. It's all downhill from here, man. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right, so Bitterbuck dies. Bitterbuck, Delacroix, and uh, another inmate named uh, Wild Bill, um, who's played expertly by Sam Rockwell in the movie. I, I Sam- thought we were talking. The movies. I'm trying to when figure out how much of the movies. I can't not talk about the movie so because it, star- it was the breakout role for Michael Clark Duncan as John Coffey. Oh, for sure, for sure. Tom Hanks as Paul Edgecombe. Um, James Cromwell as James Cromwell, uh, being all James Cromwell all over that movie. Um, this movie, this one, like, got nominated for a bunch of Oscars, right? So many Oscars. It's got stink of it on it. So something that happens is that. Uh, Paul Edgecombe falls ill. He develops a UTI and John Coffey reaches through the bars and grabs him. And of course, all of the other guards like freak out. They're like, what the hell is he doing? Why is he grabbing the guard? We're going to run over and beat the crap out of him. But before they get there, he lets go. And Paul Edgecombe is cured. Of his UTI? Of his UTI. <laughs> Look, and sometimes you just and, have powers. And he's never sick a day in his life after that. So later on in the novel, it develops that the, the warden's wife has uh, a uh, brain tumor. So they sneak John Coffey out of jail to the warden's house so that he can cure the wife and then sneak him back into jail. Mm. And then, and I don't know how much I want to say because I really want you to read this book. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this can be the one that we leave a little bit of mystery, especially All if right. people are sure, not sure. first. I want to leave a little bit of mystery. Okay. I, I will say that this uh, this book I've I've neither read or I haven't, seen it. I haven't read so. or seen it. Can I can I guess either. what happens? Yeah, do and it. potentially ruin it. Is it that he didn't actually kill those girls? He was trying to save them, and that he, they just ran in at the rat. Don't tell me if I'm right or not. If like if the, the, the police showed up right as he was like, was like, oh no, I can't actually bring them back. The little girls, and then he get he got he just got. Uh, framed for the murder. I wouldn't know. And I am looking at Michael Berry. <laughs> this is a visual medium. <laughs> but I'm not Abby, trying to. And I'm, Abby I'm, is. I'm avoiding eye contact with Abby because I don't want her to tell me if I'm right no or not. No visual tells. No yeah. visual tells. I will say Abby Wild has a terrific poker face. I have no idea if I'm right or not. Yes, but you but should find out if you haven't seen the film before. Let's discuss thematics. I want to discuss thematics. Um, I should talk about thematics into the microphone. Uh. It's a book that deals with, much like Shawshank Redemption in a way, it deals with uh, the place of hope in places without it. Mm -hmm. Uh, It deals with the 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 metaphor itself of the green mile the green it's named after the green linoleum outside of the uh, prison cells that you have to walk down to get to the ex- to get to the electric chair mm-hmm. um, the metaphor of the green mile will come back again and again as the the sort of the path you have to walk mm-hmm. to get to the end of your life the 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 last thing you have to do so what is your green mile what mm-hmm. is your journey that you have to take um, it talks about what you are and are not willing to countenance happening in your world. Uh, it talks about mora- morality objectively and morality subjectively. It's a book. It's a book about the way that the world can kill and damage beautiful things. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's. Uh, I love this book, and I wanted to talk about it because I wanted to make sure we talked about Stephen King and his non-horror element, which. Sometimes he ventures outside of horror and it's not a great experiment. And other times he ventures out and he writes things of such great human truth and beauty. Um, And this is one of those. I would sort it. I would sort it as a Gryffindor. And since neither of us have seen or read it, we're probably not to defer to your judgment on it. I would sort it as a Gryffindor because so much of this book is about figuring out what the right thing is to do and weighing that against uh, terrible consequences Mm -hmm. and figuring out where is the place at which, uh, at at which you can bear the cost. Where is the, the, the place at which the cost of doing right outweighs the cost of not doing it? Um, I can't sort it as a Hufflepuff because there aren't enough friendships in the book. There was there was definitely a part of me based on everything you said that was leaning me toward that, especially it's a book with Hufflepuffs in it, especially 
citing uh, the weight that is attributed to life and mm-hmm. the fact that we're literally a walk of death. And and I not having read the book, I can't completely speak mm-hmm. on this, but the choice of green is unique to me because I at least associate greenery with life. Mm hmm. Um, blues and greens tend to tend to be associated with life. Why for me. is life a more Hufflepuff element to you than a Gryffindor? Earth, earthiness is earthiness and badgers. Earthiness, well, in and general, like your 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 Hufflepuffs are a lot more nature based. Also, Hufflepuffs, unless I'm misremembering, like the couple of films I've seen, they usually be the ones. They're usually the ones who like call out, like, "Hey, uh, Besides everyone's egos here, is what we're doing ethical just in terms of, like, is everyone going to be safe from this? The Hufflepuffs were also leading the charge in the Let's Alienate Harry Potter in the Chamber of Secrets book. So, oh. I mean. I don't know. I didn't read them. They, I, just, I just have a podcast about it. <laughs> I just, I like, I. I'm, I'm not trying to sway you either way. I'm I, no, simply no, no, no. I know you're not. I just really wanted to throw some shade at some Hufflepuff. Sure. I'm still mad <laughs> about that. I've never heard of that. <laughs> I reread the books as a grown up recently, and I had forgotten how deeply uncomfortable Chamber of Secrets is because you read the Harry Potter books and you're like, I want to go away to Hogwarts where I'm comfortable and everything is fun. And Chamber <laughs> of Secrets is awful for everybody. No one has fun in that book. <laughs> uh, Sorry, Green Mile. I will, uh, I will say uh, if you. If you were just like hanging on the edge of your seat, just having Abby explain to you everything and get it like feeling almost like emotionally affected, you need to see her act in, in literally anything. She oh. brings more gravitas and like depth to, to, to characters than like sometimes the work even deserves. <laughs> and uh, stop it. Uh, yeah, no, honestly, I think. I think you're like you're probably the best actor I've ever I've gotten to work with, and I've gotten to work with like some cool people. So thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, man, <laughs> that means a lot to me. Thank you so much. Like yeah, I got, you- I was like, hell yeah, I'm gonna watch a Green Mile because this is a great performance right here. <laughs> yeah, probably probably the most still that we've been in a recording session. Like we can actually hear the clock you in the neighboring room. You know how hard it is to keep me still. I know. <laughs> I'm a fidgety child. I glanced over and was like, Rita's transfixed. I'm transfixed. My I should be looking my, back to Abby. My lap. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. But so, regardless of whether it's a Gryffindor or a Hufflepuff, we're so grateful that you've joined us today. Thank you yeah. so much for having me. This is delightful and and uh, I, I, I can't believe that I'm leaving town in the next couple of days because otherwise I would just like come hang out over oh, here. Oh, yeah. Abby's a, a working actor. So she, she's in between L.A. and New York, but sta- stationed mostly in New York to my great despair. <laughs> I don't to see mine you. as well. <laughs> <laughs> but only because I miss you, not because I don't think it's a place for you to be where all the actual theater seems to happen. Mm. <sighs> where can we find more of you outside of a stage near or about Broadway? Um, you could find me online at Abby Wild on Twitter or Instagram. I also have a website, which is www abbywild.com where you will find further production stills videos and other credits and abby is spelled a b b y and wild is spelled w i l d e yes hmm? i'm fancy that way uh you can find michael at belated media or me at that dang dingus uh you can also go to uh at underscore sorting hat underscore pod i've only been doing this show for a year (laughs) it's fine i'm so close i can't even know i like i for sure almost gave somebody my old twitter handle which had my dead name in it the other day (laughs) so (laughs) folks i'm doing great (laughs) uh you also are welcome to leave us a review on itunes and uh thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the sorting hat podcast bye bye (laughs) 